These words that Jesus speaks. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. Well, we're grateful to Kevin for uh, his willingness to lead us in the in the reading of God's word today. And uh, as we as we resume this conversation, Luke, we uh, we note at the beginning of the passage that uh, the crowd names one event that is weighing on their minds, and then Jesus calls uh, to their attention a second event that they were undoubtedly all aware of. And both of these events were quite troubling. The first that the crowd mentions the. The, the matter of Pilate having uh, been responsible for the slaughter of a number of Galilean Jews who had made their way to Jerusalem for a festival, uh, but, but Pilate has them killed, and that's weighing on people's minds. And then Jesus um, calls to mind another tragedy uh, from the vicinity of Jerusalem where a tower had fallen and 18 people were killed. And it's a reminder that ministry is always happening in contexts, uh, contexts that are often difficult to figure out, and um, and they're always begging for explanation. We're always trying to make sense. So in the U.S., of course, we're thinking about COVID, like everybody's thinking about COVID, but we've got an election coming up, and that's taken a lot of energy. What? How do we, how do we make sense of this, and how do we discern our way through it? And then we have uh, unrest in the cities, and there's a huge conversation happening about race right now. And then, and then on top of it all, we have hurricanes in the south and these raging fires out west, and, and ministry happens in the midst of these big stories and then the daily uh, realities of life. So as you think about returning to Ireland and the stories and the events that are weighing on people's minds and they're begging for attention and explanation, um, what's the context like in Ireland that you'll be uh, entering? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of similarities. Mm. I think the, the Black Lives Matter movement has sort of precipitated a sort of global um, introspection of, you know, what are the ways in which um, our own systems and countries have been sure. behaving in, 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 uh, in, in racial division. And so I think in Ireland, that, that's, a, that's a pressing conversation of, of how, how are we treating people of color? Uh, how, are, how do we care for immigrants? Um, I think um, there's the same sort of political disillusionment that's growing, mm -hmm. sort of an, an unhappiness with leadership. Um, that, that's a, an issue in Ireland as well. Particularly in the Irish context, I think homelessness is a, mm -hmm. is a pressing issue for many folks. Um, Dublin is one of the most expensive countries or expensive uh, cities in the, in the world to live. It's on mm -hmm. par with San Francisco okay. uh, in terms of, and so housing is an issue. There's, there's not yeah. enough houses for people. Um, mental health is a pressing uh, matter for many people in Ireland. Um, our Irish people, or, or suicide in Ireland is, is, is among the highest in Europe. Um, and so, yeah, mental health is a pressing issue. And then, of course, yeah, COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, what do we do with a global pandemic yeah. that has, has radically changed our day-to-day our -day lives? I think a lot of the, the same issues and, and discussions that are happening in the United States are sort of is very similar to those happening um, yeah. at the moment in Ireland. Okay. All right. So a uh, different country, but a lot of parallels in terms of what's happening in society and how do we minister well uh, in the midst of all of that. So that's helpful for us to hear as, as we think about uh, you and Kelsey and your, and your kids uh, heading, heading uh, east and, uh, and beginning ministry over there. So thanks. Um, 
It's understandable. Everybody's trying to explain these things, right? And, and we find Jesus addressing that in this passage when the, uh, the, the crowd asks about these Galileans, and then Jesus brings to mind those who have been killed by the falling tower. And uh, the, the conventional wisdom in that situation um, suggests that, you know, people were deserving in some way because Jesus counters that. He says, well, don't think that those who were slaughtered at the hands of Pilate uh, were worse sinners. That's not the case. That's not why they perished. Um, don't think that the th those who were killed by this tower were more deserving of judgment. That's not what's going on there. Um, so he, the first thing he does is he upends the conventional wisdom. And one author's kind of helpfully noted that, um, you know, people are going to have to make sense of Jesus' death in a moment. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's going to be killed. He's certainly not uh, a worse sinner than anybody else. He's not deserving of God's judgment and death. So already we find that uh, people are going to have to come to terms with Jesus' death and what's going on there. And conventional wisdom simply will not work. So it's interesting how he's raising that issue with this crowd on the way to Jerusalem. Um, maybe the, the more focused thing that he's doing, though, is he is um, putting himself right at the center of all history here. Uh, people are trying to make sense of times and events. What are we supposed to do with Pilate's violence? What are we supposed to do with this tragic falling tower? Um, and Jesus uh, turns the whole matter to the issue of repentance. A time has begun with his arrival. Um, the promises of God are being fulfilled in Jesus. Mm. John the Baptist is using similar language to the parable we'll get to in just a moment. Um, but he's, he's confronting people who are certain that uh, this Jesus is not going to be the fulfillment of God's promises, the final interpreter of God's will. Jesus faces that same opposition. Luke, the gospel writer, is facing that same or uh, confronting that same opposition to Jesus. And yet John the Baptist and Jesus and Luke keep saying, no, no, no. It's Jesus. He's the fulfillment of God's promises. He's the final interpreter of God's will. And Jesus is calling people in this moment to turn to him, to recognize him, to receive him, to follow him. Mm. All of which gets to the matter of the significance of Jesus and what we say about him. Mm. And I'm curious, so you're going to be in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have been part of the church and they've left the church and maybe Jesus isn't at the center of the conversation. You're going there to make him the center of the conversation. And you're mm. going to be encountering people and you're going to be talking about Jesus. And some people are going to say, Luke, what is the big deal about Jesus? Why is he so significant? Right. How do you, how do you begin to answer that question for people that are truly seeking and yeah. trying to understand? I, I thought you said this wasn't going to be like my class's examination. Oh, I don't know. I mean, this is just good <laughs> conversation. So. Well, no, you know, to point people to Jesus um, is, is our greatest, is, is the richest um, role we have, right? Yeah. Um, well, the significance of Jesus is not, Jesus is not simply significant because of what he does. When you've touched this a little bit, Jesus is significant because of who he is. Yeah. Jesus is the living God incarnate, yeah. the one who is yeah. reconciling all things unto himself. He's yeah. redeeming this world. Uh, and Jesus is significant simply because of who he is. Uh, life, reality, experience makes sense in light of the, the revealed God uh, we, we were given in Jesus. Right. So simply, that's an, a message enough worth proclaiming. Right. Um, but then uh, Jesus is at work in our world. Jesus is doing something. He has done something, is doing, and will do more. Yeah. Um, and so Jesus seeks to break into the broken and dark places in our world. And so like some of the things I mentioned, we talk about you know, Black Lives Matter and racial division within our communities. Jesus has shown us the way of reconciliation. We yeah. know how to pursue that and bless our, our communities with the reconciliation that Jesus gives. Yeah. Um, we've talked about COVID-19. We need not fear death because yeah. Jesus has overcome death. And um, we talk about, you know, uh, loneliness and isolation and depression and mental health issues. Jesus, the light of the world, breaks into those dark places with his yeah. grace and his love. Um, yeah. So Jesus is significant because of, because of who he is, right. but also because of what he does and seeks to do in, in, in redeeming our broken and lost world. Yeah. 
No, that's really good. That's really good. Thank you uh, for for beginning to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, one of the one of the interesting parts of this parable, this passage, and maybe the part that becomes a little bit uncomfortable for us is is the urgency that's that's really being played out uh, throughout this passage um repent or else right uh, so so don't don't be quick to draw the line between uh somebody's perishing and what you assume must be true as the cause or the reason for it don't don't use that logic but unless you repent yeah you too will perish Right. And we hear this uh, at work in the parable too, then this, the owner of the vineyard comes and there's this tree that's been there long enough to bear fruit and the thing just won't bear any fruit. And the owner of the vineyard says, that's enough. Uh, time to chop you down. You are out. And, and we hear in there um, the sound of judgment. Uh, Jesus is signaling an alarm of sorts. There's a warning here and repent or face judgment. And that's a hard thing in our society right now. This idea of judgment, we just find, well, we just sound too judgy. People mm -hmm. don't want that, right? So there's something about what's um, at, at the middle of this parable, really at the heart of the passage, that's, that can be really difficult to come to terms with. So mm -hmm. we've talked about this a little bit over the week, but when we think about this, uh, the reality of judgment at play in the parable, Mm. Um, and maybe a reluctance to really emphasize that theme. Mm. There's still a sense in which we recognize not just the validity of the judgment of God, but also uh, the goodness of it. And mm. I'm wondering if, if you might share some of your reflections on that um, as we've talked about it from earlier in the week. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. When, you know, when I, when I, think about the, the ancient people of Israel, the Hebrews, and we look at some of the Old Testament texts, we see in there, when they long for the day of the Lord, uh, you know, this, this, the coming of the Messiah, the, right. um, they long for the judgment. Right. <laughs> you know, they long for um, when, when, when things are going to be set right, when people are going to be held accountable for their yeah, actions. Yeah, that's, that's right. Sort of a, right. You know, from, from our, this side of the cross, we tend to, you know, we look forward to the redemption and the renewal and the consummation of all things, the good, beautiful vision of Isaiah, right. um, Isaiah 64, 65, yeah. um, the new heavens and the new earth, you know, um, whereas for the people of Israel, actually, it was, it was the judgment side of things that they sort of celebrated and, and longed yeah. for, which is interesting to think about. Right. But when, I th when I think about judgment, I think about justice, I think about yeah. our, our current moment, you know, there are people marching in the streets saying, who's going to be held accountable for all this injustice we see? Mm. Um, there are, you know, countless movements of, of longing for, for things to be set right, for people to be held accountable, for a, a sure. certain balance and order to be restored. Um, and I think we, we in, in this text, that, that, um, this text speaks to that, I, I think, that longing for, for balance, for, for order, for justice, mm. for equity. Sure. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, I think the, the cross of Jesus, uh, you know, who, who's going to be held accountable for all the wrong in this world? Yeah. And Jesus steps forward and says, I will. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll, I'll be held accountable for all the wrong right. and, and all the sin and all the, the brokenness. And, and I will take it upon myself and I'll provide a way um, of redemption and mercy and, and sort of almost rebalance the scales by my death and my sacrifice yeah. as a sufficient sacrifice for it all. Um, and so, yes, we find in, in, in Jesus a sort of answer to, uh, to judgment. Yeah. But then there's his second coming. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't know. That's right. Know. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, the way you put it is, is really helpful to be thinking about, right? Uh, celebrating the judgment of God because all gets put right. right? right. And, and evil is held in check and, and removed from the sphere of, of life. Uh, so we long for that. And then there's the realization of, well, we're all deserving of judgment. Right. So that becomes, so, so suddenly we have, oh, we, we want what God is going to do. Uh, and yet we, we're, we're held in check by the reality of, uh, well, well, us too then, right? So, yeah. so we find, we find uh, you know, the good news in Jesus being crucified for us, taking the judgment. Which right. really, which really then uh, helps us see part of our calling as the church uh, in this present time. So the urgency of what Jesus is speaking of here, it's only through him. 
repentance to him, uh, turning to him, is the only way to avoid the, the condemnation um, right. of side of God's judgment. Right. And, and by receiving him, uh, you're, you're, you're welcomed into reconciliation. Yeah. And then we have this move at the end of the, of the parable um, with all of that urgency being highlighted. The gardener says, hold, hold on, um, just a moment yet. It, 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 almost like Abraham praying for Sodom. Lord, would you spare the city for 50, for 40, for 30, for 10? We even for 10. Yeah. And the gardener's like, just give me a year. Let me, let me take care of this tree. I'm going to spread manure around this thing. I'm going to nurture it, see if it bears fruit one more year. And it reminds us a bit of, uh, I think, of uh, 2 Peter 3. Is the Lord slow in keeping his promises? Well, no, that's not exactly. The Lord is, the Lord is kind. Mm. The Lord, the Lord doesn't want anyone to perish, but for mm. people to come to repentance. Yeah. And I wonder if you might say a yeah. little bit about that in terms of how you kind of see the yeah. significance of the moment as yeah. we all are participants in the gospel and what's our yeah. vocation here. Yeah, you know, it, it gives us a posture. Yeah. Um, there are some in, in that in the crowd that Jesus is talking to, and they're pointing the finger. Yeah, that's oh, right. The, the, those who the tower fell on, they were yeah. sinners, and they got their comeuppance. Um, you know, um, those who died in uh, in Pilate's um, campaign, they deserved what they got. And we live in a moment of finger pointing. Yeah. Um, those those Republicans, those Democrats, those Libertarians, those Black Lives Matter, those whoever, we live in a, a moment of of pointing out the sin or the the disagreement. In the other yeah and when really jesus points us actually no that's not our posture our posture is look at your own heart yeah look at look at the 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 longings the the brokenness the sin uh within your own life and find in me <laughs> the forgiveness the redemption and the strength that you need uh, to live according according to the things of god yeah and so i think it, it shifts our, our posture away from a finger pointing this way actually to a finger pointing this way and yeah. this place. that's right I've received the mercy. Come, come, join me as a recipient of mercy. Yes, yeah, the patient of God setting all things yeah. right. Yeah, and it shifts our posture away. You know, yeah. the sort of a, a harsh antagonism, antagonism yeah. towards the other, when yeah. really, you know, we we catch in the in the the gardener here a, a yeah. kind of care and compassion for those who aren't bearing fruit. Yeah. You know, for the trees that aren't bearing fruit. And what if we had a heart of compassion for those mm. who we he disagree with? Who you know. Yeah. Are, are not repentant who aren't having come to a realization of who jesus is yeah what if our, our our posture towards them was one of of nourishment and care yeah. and wanting yeah. them to flourish yeah uh, but instead often i think we want their demise mm -hmm. <laughs> um which is uh yeah yeah we're invited to live into the tension that from our perspective is inherent in the life of god the character of god the insistence on truth righteousness justice on the one hand right and, and yet Mercy, yeah. kindness, compassion. It's hard for us to fathom. How does God hold all of that together? That's a right. mystery to us, yep. except we're drawn into the mystery. We're going to insist on God and the truth of God and, and righteousness and all the rest and embody mercy yeah. and compassion right. and kindness. It's really, uh, it's really quite a calling and vocation for all of us as uh, those drawn into the body of Christ. So. Right. Yeah, well, I appreciate uh, this conversation. Uh, we're going to wrap up the formal part here in just a moment. But uh, before we do, I, I had said, hey, um, you know, you've been in the States eight years now. You've been ministering in Holland for about a year. Um, we're partners in ministry formally through, uh, you know, the support that will extend to you. Um, as you prepare to leave Holland, do you have, do you have something of a parting word for the church in Holland um, as you prepare to move to Ireland? Yeah, you know, as I was leaving Hardwick, you know, sitting in the uh, committee meeting, and and they they asked me the same thing. Any, oh, any sort of parting words? I think there were sort of three. There's three things I've been reflecting on, particularly in light of of, of COVID nineteen and some of the challenges that it has posed to us. And I think the church needs innovation. Mm. The church needs imagination, mm. and the church needs mobilization. Mm. Innovation. We need to be willing to try new things in this new season of sort of uncharted territory. Sure. We need sort of a willingness to, to adapt to what mm. is going on in our current moment, uh, which requires imagination. Yeah. What are the new ways in this disruption that God might be 
probing and, and pushing within us new ideas, new visions, new longing to see ways in which his kingdom might be grown in our communities. Uh, have we been thinking too small, too narrow? You know, are, are, our, are our Sunday morning gatherings enough? You know, can we think bigger and broader and more innovative in, in imagining for the kingdom? Yeah. Um, and then the third is mobilization. I think there's a lethargy, a, a tiredness, a weariness that has creeped mm-hmm. into the American church. And I think mm-hmm. partly it's precipitated because we, we've had relative comfort um, mm-hmm. for, for a generation. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, well, COVID-19 has sort of disturbed that comfort a little. You know, a Barna study came out in July that said that one third of most congregations when COVID-19 happened completely dropped off engagement they're not mm-hmm. checking in online they're not connected yep. with one third right, of the community. right right um, and so i think we we need a, a fresh intentionality a fresh mobilization of god's people mm. to be innovative and imaginative and engaged in the work of god in our current yeah moment. yeah so i don't know if that's helpful for you that that's i mean that's 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 an encouragement it's a challenge it's a it's a good reminder so uh we appreciate that and uh um you know, the encouragement to carry on, even as we encourage you to carry on in a, in a new context and the relearning that has to happen in the midst of all of that. So, right. I and it all, it all happens around the centrality of Jesus. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. Revealing God who's made himself accessible and available yeah. and strengthens us and guides us and leads us. His, yeah. The wind of the spirit still blowing, you know. It's blowing. That's right. That's right. He's going to catch it. So, Luke, this has been a real treat for us, um, you know, to be able to converse and to hear from you, to get to know you better, uh, to get a, a bit of a sneak preview into what you're anticipating in Ireland. So I want to leave you with a blessing, um, you know, as we sign off here on this conversation. But for you, Kelsey, Cohen, Ida, our brothers and sisters already in Ireland, uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again, Luke. This has been a pleasure. Blessings, guys.